Cool, thank you. Um, good to be back. I think this is what the fifth or sixth one of these I've done now. Um, some familiar faces, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, a little bit of an introduction from me. Most people on the call I do recognise, but I'm Stuart Baxter, Microsoft MVP in the business apps category. Been a Power Apps community super user for about 18 months now. Um, special thanks to Charlie Phipps for turning me on to the community forums. That's that's how I ended up becoming an MVP. Um, alongside Charlie, I'm co-founder of Scottish Power Platform User Group. We hold events up in Scotland kind of every couple of months. And more recently, I'm now a practice lead for Power Platform with Robiquity based down in Manchester. I've been working in the industry, quite scary to say this, just over 10 years. So lots of experience from way back at CRM4 through CRM 2011, right up to Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. So a little bit about why are we here? Um, without putting a finer point on it, theming in the app on start is rubbish. It involves huge JSON objects that are loaded when your app starts and it will slow you down, slow down your app. And from a user point of view, nobody likes a slow app. We're all busy people, we've all got things to do. No one wants to sit for three or four minutes waiting on something loaded. There is a better way. Um, recently, Microsoft released app formulas. I'm going to explain a bit more about what app formulas are in a moment, but these effectively negate the need for massive app on start stuff. A few key features, they're always available. There's no dependency on timing and no dependency on the app on start and no time that the value is incorrect. Effectively, users are not sitting waiting as long as they don't have circular references, you can calculate them in parallel as well. So previously in the app on start, you might do a concurrent. Concurrency is built in to app formulas. They're always up to date. When you change a control or a property that it depends on, it changes. No need to set a variable again when you switch on dark mode, for example. They're immutable. The definition is it's a single source of the truth. The value can't be changed unless something involved in the calculation is changed. With a variable, it's possible to get some unexpected changes in the values. This is just not possible in named formulas. It doesn't mean it needs to be static. It can change, but only changes if the things that are used to calculate the changes. It's deferred. This is my favourite thing about these. So if we have, for example, a formula that's not used and still screen two, we don't calculate it on screen one, because screen one's not screen two. We calculate it on screen two when we need it. And this is particularly useful for theming, where you might have, for example, a theme that's only applied to a combo box. Your welcome screen doesn't have combo boxes. Why go to the hassle of calculating it? Calculate it when you get to a screen with a combo box and everyone has a good time. No one's waiting for two and a half minutes for an app to open. I think that's enough PowerPoint. No one wants to sit and listen to me reading PowerPoints all day. So on to some demos. Just going to share my screen. And we should hopefully see. Into what are you doing? We should hopefully see on screen here an app that says this is some text. My screen share is being weird. Give me two seconds. There we go. So we should see a really, really boring app here. We're going to do the super boring app actually and start with simple theming. So this is how people are maybe used to doing theming before. There's all sorts of blogs out there in terms of how to do this. I'm not going to labour on this too much just to demonstrate what you might have done before. In your app on start, you set a bunch of global variables for different colours. In your properties, you refer to those colours. Nothing exciting, as we alluded to at the start, it's super duper slow and no one wants a slow app. 
kind of ways we can do this. If we look at our combo box here, for example, and we look at our Chevron hover fill here, or a border color, for example, we refer to global app colors dot green. As I say, not the ideal way. Very, very, very slow involves potentially huge JSON objects. Onto our alternative. So this is a very similar app here. Using app formulas. Don't want to give it a modern theme. We're going to do that in a minute. We can look at our app formulas. A few key things that are do differently in app formulas compared to that massive JSON object. It might seem ideal initially to have a JSON object with nested arrays and things in there. I don't like that approach because what that's going to mean is anytime you call one of the nested ones, it's going to call the whole object. And that kind of defeats the purpose of efficiency. So I like to break it down initially using things like theme app spacing. This would be used for your padding, your spacing between items on containers, all that sort of good stuff. Set it once. When your customer then says, oh, I like this, but it's really squashed or it's too much space between them, change these two numbers, problem solved. It's fairly common for an app to have a header. Set some basic properties on here. You could go a bit further and set things like underline is true and, and all this sort of stuff. But just to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, fairly basic stuff. Size of the heading, which font, which color, which weight. This is our header here. In the size we refer back to that object. In the event we're on a screen that doesn't have a header, we're not calculating that, we're not slowing it up then. Really, really simple stuff there. And I think everyone's probably well versed with containing the size and so on in here. What you could also do as well if you wanted is go a level down here and do some calculation and say, OK, if screen size is one, set the text size to smaller. If screen size is four, play around with your sizes and use your app formulas to do that as well if you wanted. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, these are able to be calculated from other formulas, so really, really quite powerful here. Not going to bore you with theme body text. That's the same as theme header text, but smaller text, different colors. When we move on to buttons, our traditional buttons have all sorts of properties. We could set them in here. We could set border colors, hover colors, details of the label, all this sort of stuff. With these ones here, I do like to nest these in that same object. So the theme button control contains objects for fills, borders, label. The reality is if you have a, a button, it's going to have borders, it's going to have labels, it's going to have fills. Calculate that all at once. There's not going to be many cases where you don't have a label and a fill on a button. Like that's that's not a thing. So it's perfectly acceptable to contain these in here, makes it a bit easier to read. And with our button, it's just simple dot notation, or hover fill, theme button control dot fills dot hover fill. Simple stuff, nothing fancy at all there. Let's make a few quick changes to our app and see how that would impact things. So we can go down here, not a button. I don't want blue buttons anymore. My customer likes red. Just like that, we've got a red button. It's all done, that's changed, everything's all calculated. We could, if we wanted to even refer to a base theme color or something along those lines and, and even refer to that within our formulas as well. Um, I found this particularly useful. We were recently working with a customer who were branded as bright orange with dark blue text. Sounds horrific, it looked really nice though. They were bought over by another company and overnight went from orange and blue to blue and orange. Effectively, all of their apps had to be reversed. Because we used this simple approach here, we went and we changed two colors, everything was all sorted in all of their apps. It really was that easy. Um, when working with Dataverse, we could even contain within 
for example, an environment variable, pop our JSON objects into there, refer back to them. What that would then mean is to make it even easier to maintain, you're referring back to the same environment variable in all your apps. You go in, you update the colors, everything would pull all the way through. So there's a lot we can do with app formulas. Um, as we know, we're moving into modern controls quite soon. These are in preview at the moment, but they're moving over really quite soon into production use. And I want to show you how we can make things even simpler using modern controls. So here's a modern controls equivalent. In our app formulas, we've got similar objects, the map spacing. There are a few key differences to be aware of. With your modern controls, you do have the ability to modify your fonts, your colors, your weights, etc. Key part here, our traditional fonts we would refer to as font.arial, for example. In modern controls, we refer to it just as a string, just Arial or whichever font we're going for. With our weights, we take the same as well. Traditionally, it's font weight.bold, font weight.regular, font weight.lighter, etc. On your modern controls, it is a string. <coughs> We're not necessarily using this straight away. There are some basic options that come with modern controls. So we had this really annoying pop up from earlier on where we can go through and we can change these in here. It's nothing fancy. It's limited at the moment. You don't have custom options there. Where this all becomes easier to customize, though, I'm going to jump over to our advanced screen here. We'll go into our themes. As we can see, nothing is changing here. This is all handled in our app formulas. We're going to go back, preview app formulas. Because the modern controls do have simplified properties, that doesn't necessarily mean they're limited down to not having the same level of customization. Let's say I want my button to be red. We'll set red in here. We've got this stored in our base palette for our button control. Then all we do, pop into our button, property called base palette color, refer back to that object. There's a few other cool things we can do in here as well. I quite like some of the reds and greens that come with it. So we can do our apps theme. Oh, Colors, darker, lighter, etc. We can do red theme, green theme, etc. Refer back this way. It's a fairly common requirement to have a green button for yes and a red button for no, for example. There's no need to go over the top with theming these. There is a red theme, there is a green theme. We can very simply refer to these. You could even refer to that in your app formulas and put that in the base palette cover for those controls if you wanted. So they then come back three months later and say, yes, great, it's red, but do you know about red, green color wind and that shade's off? Interesting with the two Microsoft ones, the shade is off for red, green color wind and red, blue color wind. Um, we could very easily using your app formulas take out the red theme.colors.primary and replace it with a darker shade of that or even a custom color if we wanted. And that's that's my demo. Um, I appreciate there's quite a few people on the call with quite a bit of experience in Canvas apps. Do we have any questions or any thoughts or feedback? I think, um, hi Stuart, it's Charlie. Hi Charlie. Uh, really liked that demo. Um, it was really clean um, and precise. I think one thing to highlight that you uh, mentioned as well is it's really useful for the dark high contrast and sort of default mode um, to switch between. Um, and then you can still pull in uh, from Teams the defaulted theme that your users are using. So if your app sits with inside Teams, it can still pick up from the formulas. Yeah. Um, I have actually used that in the past, particularly with Teams apps. Um, when I was with Curve Digital, I know there's a few people from Curve on the call today. 
we did a whole load of internal stuff, in particular the acronym builder, which as the name suggests, the basic acronyms that every business in the world uses. And being able to pull directly from teams and then set your theme based on that was really, really powerful stuff. And we ended up with a stripped down version of high contrast. I know they have like luminous blue buttons and luminous yellow text, for example. When thinking about accessibility for customers, we should always, always consider it, but not necessarily go full bone over the top and have 17 different colours in high contrast. If there is a need though, app formulas can definitely handle it and it will definitely be faster doing it that way than a massive JSON object in your app on start, for example. Um, worth noting as well, app formulas can refer to individual controls as well. So if you had, for example, a toggle that's light mode, dark mode, you could refer to that control to find out am I on light mode or dark mode and update your formulas accordingly. Um, any other questions, concerns, comments? Does anyone have any examples of situations where they've had to make a massive change to a Canvas app and the approach that they've had so far in terms of changing the overall UI quickly. Is it just some positive feedback um, for, for really nice approach you've taken there? And yeah, definitely felt the pains in the past, like you said, where you've got the super slow on load times and basically the, the bigger the app, the more that pain point, um, yeah. the more you feel that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it always was, seems to be a client doesn't particularly care about the styling until you feel you're done. Then all of a sudden they've got um, a million different opinions and it always seems to be last minute, at least in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my former colleague Madeline's on the call today as well. Um, we worked with a, a government organisation who, very similar to that, came to the end of the project. We were approaching going live and it went through an accessibility audit and there was so much feedback came back on the back of it. Um, we used a variation of this approach. Unfortunately, it was pre-app formulas, but been able to very quickly say, okay, you don't like that green because it's not accessible. We'll change one value and everything will pull through the rest of the app. It was, it was a frustrating day, but it could have been a lot worse if we hadn't used some sort of theming in there. Um, on the subject to government stuff, I know this is kind of slightly off piste. There is the GDS design kit, but if anyone on the call is working with any kind of government customers, they do provide JSON objects that contain the different colours that governments use. Um, I would strongly urge you if you're going through any kind of pre-sales activity, do have a look at that and do build your kind of proof of concept apps to to be roughly in line with the kind of things that governments expect um it's not rocket science it's a set of colors and a set of guidance in terms of what you should and shouldn't do worth mentioning this isn't exclusive to just uk government it's also covered by things like the Army, the Navy, the Ministry of Justice, um, the Procurator Fiscal, all these kind of things as well. So anything that's central or local gov, largely they do use GDS. And that's often a good starting point. Um, I've actually referred back to it a few times for non-government customers and said, look, everyone's familiar with a gov.uk website. They all work the same, they all feel the same. Here's the kind of things you might want to consider when talking about accessibility for your users and, and making a nice looking app. Like at the end of the day, no one wants to spend all day staring at, without putting a finer point on it, the most boring app in the world that I showed you right back at the start there. In the modern world, this, this is not an acceptable UI for a modern user. People are bored of the standard blue. They're bored of the standard buttons. Let's make it easier for them but also make it easier for ourselves when building it when 
the inevitable happens and two weeks before go live they give you a million pieces of feedback like like Francesco managed there. Um, any other questions or comments anyone? It is. I mean, just a general question about um, your UI UX design. Um, where did you learn most part of it? I work in the government, quite honestly. So I've done, I've gone through two quite extensive projects with government, and there was a few things that stood out to me during that journey. The first of them was quite honestly the lowest point in my career. We'd built an, an app for a bunch of customers and naively when they said we don't need to worry about accessibility, we didn't consider accessibility. Charlie's face says it all. Of course you have to worry about accessibility lesson learned that day. We put it out to a bunch of test users and one lady in the corner very quietly put her hand up and said, you do realise I can't see that? And naively we responded, if you press the plus button in the bottom left, it will zoom in and she was like, no, no, you're not following me. I can't see anything. I'm blind. And we were like, oh, so we do need to worry about accessibility. And we do need to worry about user interface. And we do need to consider how this lady is going to do her job. Because she has a job and it's this job and she can't see. And that, that kind of put me on the path to thinking about everyone and really, really drilling down into how important that is to get it right for our users. User design goes much further than people who can't see though. We've obviously got to consider people who can see because the reality is that most of us can, but it's trying to strike that balance between something that looks visually great for me, you and most other people on this call, that's also accessible for someone who can't see and is behaving in the way the screen readers and things expect. Started diving into GDS, there's a lot of really, really, really good advice on there. Um, doesn't necessarily just tie to government. I've actually used it for, as I said before, a lot of non-government projects to look at some of the basic design patterns they have. Um, the UK government get a lot of things wrong, but their design standard is pretty exceptional to be honest it covers pretty much every given scenario and to keep it really really simple anytime you're building something think about the customer inevitably you're probably going to be dealing with business analysts product owners other developers <laughs> key stakeholders who are involved in paying for it to put it bluntly at the end of the day none of those people matter the person that matters at the end of the day is the person we hand the system over to to use every single day. Keep that in the back of your mind every time you make a decision and keep pushing back on those product owner BA kind of people who are like, we need to get this done quickly. We do, but what's the point if the end user hates it? And that's I, that's the key part for me with experience design. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and those stakeholders, stakeholders you just mentioned don't tend to come out of the woodwork, do they, and defend you at the end and say, oh, yeah, we did say, actually, in fairness, push it through as quickly as possible, or let's um, sidestep that decision for now. You're yeah. usually defending for yourself, aren't you? So great tip. Slightly controversial statement from me. I do believe that a level of technical debt in a project is acceptable, but only if there is no detriment to the end user. That's that's a kind of motto of mine when dealing with we need to cut corners to do things quickly. If that's going to affect a lady called Claire who is blind, I'm not doing it. I, honestly, that as I said before, that was a low point in my career. I never want to see anyone in that position again. And I can't imagine how that particular lady felt as well. To effectively be sitting in a corner and everyone had forgotten about her, including me. So by all means, technical debt to an extent is OK. Maybe not great, but OK to a certain extent. Just don't cut corners that are going to affect your end user. Um, 
does anyone want to share any hints and tips they might have found when using app formulas or user experience design over the last few months? Charlie, I know you've built some great looking apps over the last little while. Just repeat that. Um, I just wanted to see if anyone wanted to share anything in terms of what they've built over the last few months with app formulas or in particular considering user experience. Um, I don't have anything to hand that I can show, um, which wouldn't, which isn't classified essentially. Um, but one thing that I would uh, add to your point that you were saying about technical debt and how you deal with the sort of usability and theming and UI and UX is typically every project I price, I always build usability and accessibility and performance into NFRs. So you won't get an app from me that doesn't meet those standards. Um, and, you know, as a business, if that means that we're more expensive than, I don't know, a competitor. That's that's our choice as a business because, you know, we want to reassure that we provide the quality or the service, etc. So everyone has different approaches um, and you'll always have those people above you saying ah oh, come on can't you do this quicker can't you do it cheaper you know is there any corners we can cut um and i think that's been the lesson learned in my life, is if you cut corners now you build that technical debt later um and then it ends up costing you more so <coughs> i try to build a lot of that into nfrs now non-functional requirements um really a good point yeah i think we've got a responsibility as the people building things as well to to guide our key stakeholders who might say things like we don't think anyone in the company's colorblind for example now, there's probably more people than you you would imagine are colorblind we have a responsibility from our experience to see actually you're a company with nine thousand people are you sure no one's colorblind and the reality is, in order to, I don't want to say solve because you can't solve color blindness, but to make it more accessible, we have a responsibility to say actually, that's not a four one one contrast. That that's too low. That's going to affect people, and almost push back on it and advise on what we think is acceptable based on our experience. It's sometimes difficult to to have those conversations, but the the underlying thread behind this should be doing the right thing for your customers and um, like charlie says building technical debt and costing more money later no one wants a surprise bill at the end of the project for another three months to make the app accessible for five percent of their business for example um nathan i notice you've got your hand up mate so i'm going to shut up for a minute oh thanks Stuart. um brilliant presentation um you said that you're acceptable that a um a level of technical debt is acceptable to you um um when you're when you're building can you give a specific example i'm just trying to get my head around it um so high level example of a recent one um we know there are a bunch of features that are currently in preview that are fast approaching being ready for production use with We've reviewed them on experience.dynamics.com and there's a thing coming in a month's time that's going to make something much faster to do. Customer requests something similar to that feature. You know that that's three weeks worth of work to effectively replicate that feature. You might say, look, with two options here, we can custom build it and keep that forever. Mm -hmm. We can not build it at all and wait for a month or we can build a quick short-term solution to do you for a month and then switch that off, move over to the new release feature. Um, another example as well, working with government customers, there's various APIs that are scheduled to get updated at different points. Um, an example might be gov.notify that sends out all the UK government communications. Sometimes it's okay if you know they are making a change in a month, to build a, for want of a better phrase, a hacky workaround that you know is going to be replaced at some point. The key part for me with technical debt 
is being transparent with the customer mm -hmm. and having that conversation around is this an acceptable web or technical debt and more importantly do we have a scheduled swap to resolve it forgetting about it and leaving it in the backlog and saying we'll pick it up at some point is not acceptable in my book it should be planned into some sort of future sprint whether it's two weeks time three weeks time three months time <coughs> when building technical debt the key is to build into that here is the the point that we cut this off and, and fix it okay and you design it in a way that it, it's modular enough that you can swap it in and out that's key as well yeah having a an exit plan um, cool. well, one of the really interesting customers i worked with recently as part of their technical design they stipulated an exit plan and when I first saw it, I made a bit of a job with him and said, are you planning on getting rid of us after this? And was almost surprised when his answer was, maybe, I don't know yet. But if we do, <laughs> I need to know how. But yeah, really, really interesting approach there. They, they consider how to remove something when building it because there's always a possibility. You do the same with technical debt. If you're going to build something with the intention of removing it, build it in a way that's easy to remove it. Nice. Thank you. Really valid points there. Thanks, Nathan. And thank you for joining from so far away as well. Um, it's a pleasure. We've got some hands up. Adam Patterson. Hi, Stuart. Yeah, that was uh, great. Thank you. Um, it, it's quite topical at the minute for me because um, I've fairly recently moved over from doing the whole um, sort of on star properties for, for themes. I've started moving over to formulas. Um, and something that I'm sort of experiencing at the moment is um sort of a clash between accessibility and wanting to sort of stay close to a company's um color palette when you're sort of working for them um do you have any experience of sort of trying to balance balance those two things if a company kind of you know wants to stick to their um color color sort of palette but in an app format it can be quite challenging particularly like you say people who've got sort of color blind issues and that sort of thing um UK government is right for this. So I mentioned about the GDS cover palette earlier on. GDS yellow is not accessible. Um, we have a responsibility to push back and say, I appreciate you want yellow. That particular yellow is not accessible, but this shade that's fairly close to it is, and basically take the customer by the hand and guide them to the correct course of action. Quite often in doing that, I'll refer to the WCAG guidelines and things like that, but also bring in some examples from experience in the past. Um, I am blue green colorblind, for example. I've been able to say to them, I can't see that. Even just that, that's that's sometimes enough. Mm -hmm. um, there are highly publicized guidelines out there, and there's also the, the Accessibility Act coming up as well. That's that's been a really useful tool for me, being able to say, actually, this isn't accessible and remember this thing's coming over the horizon that you really have to comply to. Here is my advice. We can still go yellow, but we're supposed to slightly different yellow, for example. And just kind of working on our consultancy skills and making sure that we are giving them the right information. We can't control the decision they make and they may, may well say, actually, no, stay with the colour palette. Our job really is to make sure they know the the pros and cons of both approaches. Yeah, yeah, no, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Thank you. One other thing I have done in the past as well is changed it for a very short time on another proof of concept that we were building. So basically, the next app and said, "How does this work?" Kept it open ended and they said, "Oh, it looks great." So, how do you feel about the border colour? Oh, it looks great. You know, that's a slightly different yellow from yours, but you didn't notice, and it's accessible. Mm. And of course, there was that penny drop moment where they were like, yeah, that's still on brand, but it's accessible. Great. Can we have that everywhere? So sometimes mm. it's guiding them by the hand. Sometimes it's, I don't want to say tricking them, but it's leading them towards the right answer, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that. That's sort of what 
I'd probably be trying to do something along those lines. But yeah, that works. Thank you. Not that I would ever recommend trekking across the mark, but <laughs> yeah, gain them by the hand. Um, Madeline. Hey, Stuart. Um, thanks for that. I just thought I'd, I'd chime in if I can. It's a slight deviation from the last um, question, but going back to the idea of, of um, accessibility and, and thinking about uh, your users and um, it was just sort of two, I suppose, things I kind of keep in my mind. Um, the first, well, the first is if anyone building at any apps at any time has a chance to have a full accessibility audit, just take the chance. It will annoy the hell out of you. Uh, but it is so useful because there are so many things that as an uh, an able-bodied person or a non-neurodivergent person you just don't think of uh, in terms of um, how you put an app together um, and it's been very very eye-opening I think for everybody in my current project um, the things that are actually picked up that we thought were were fine so if you get a chance to do it uh, do that uh, also uh, I, I would recommend getting a chance to test with a screen reader um, to see how important it is to get the screen reader right because it can haunt your dreams. Um, so imagine what it's like if that's what you have to rely on. Um, the other thing is that as I think as devs, we are we very much, oh, well, not everybody, I'm not tying everyone with the same brush. We tend to sit behind our computer and build, you know, A to B to C. Um, and I'm working on a presentation at the moment uh, at Curve uh, in which we're talking about how important it is to, as a dev to work incredibly closely with user research. If you get the opportunity to do that, obviously we don't always get the opportunity because when we don't have user research on the project, we are the user researchers and we have to be the user researchers. We have to not just think about going from A to B to C and what seems logical to us. Uh, and what seems logical as a way to to sort of close out a story or to achieve something, we have to think about how it is best to go from A to B to C for your client. And that might not necessarily be that logical way. So it's thinking all the time on it in an accessible way and sort of slightly away from a logical dev way. Um, just yeah. building on the point around user research, um, I fully agree on that, by the way. Um, last couple of projects we've had one with limited exposure towards the end of a project where they made a load of suggestions that as soon as we saw it we were like can't believe we didn't think of that the project previous to that was very strictly working with user researchers every word that was displayed on a screen was suggested by one of them and it made our life so much easier but through that project, we learned so much around simple things like what if this customer doesn't speak English as their first language? Can they understand what's on screen? Now, in the modern world, there's a lot of outsourcing. There's a lot of working with multicultural people, we'll say. Not everyone who uses it does have English as their first language. Um, particularly the government, for example, there's there's a massive country down the bottom left called Wales, and you'd be surprised to hear how many people in Wales don't speak English. Um, one project I worked on was a massive eye opener. And um, yeah, working with user researchers, they went through and they were like, yeah, move that over there. Sometimes it was, it's more on brand with everything else we've built over there. It feels more familiar to our users. But sometimes it was as high level as if English is not my first language, I don't know what that means. And thinking about those kind of things when we're building our apps as well. I know that's completely off track from app formulas and colours and so on, but really meaningful points in there, Madeline. So thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments? Amy? Hi, right, Stu, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hold on one sec, my head's just gone off. All right, can you hear me? Sorry. Yep, can you hear you, okay, yep. Kevin? All right, all right, all right. Sorry, I've just been having a couple of mic, mic issues there. Yeah, I just wanted to say for me, this is a really great pre great presentation. I've really liked a lot of the stuff which, you, which you've been uh, demonstrating as well. 
and it's definitely a lot of stuff, stuff which I'm going to be taking taking forward as well. And it's, it's very interesting because a lot of the stuff which you've been saying about, I've been having like very similar co- conversations recently with my girlfriend because she's a Power BI developer for a large cosmetics company. And like it's just like it's just getting all the, all these core fundamentals like n- nailed down about us- usability. And I'm wondering would you be able to like share like any like links to any any useful guides such as the G such as um the GDR kit which you mentioned before before as well because I feel like like stuff like that will be like very useful going forward for me, me as well to have worked with quite quite a few government departments and local councils. Um, re- recently as well. Two seconds. Can I post a question? Uh, oh yeah, I can respond to your question actually. Uh, yeah. oh, Will's actually responded just a couple of minutes ago. Um, I am going to follow this up with yeah. a blog post as well that will have all the kind of links I've referred to in there as well. That should likely be out, I think maybe Monday or Tuesday. Um, I appreciate we were quite fast with the initial approach, the mid approach and the modern controls one. And it's, it's quite a lot to take in over. 15 minutes of me rambling, quite honestly. But yeah, that'll be followed up next week as well. Um, another one I really recommend, if you want some practice with doing theming, but don't have yeah. a particular project that requires it, um, look up the, it's a system called JET, J-E-T, all in capital letters. Um, pretty much everyone that's on the call will have interacted with this at some point without knowing it. Jet is just the takeaway. It's one of the most famous design systems out there. How easy is it to order your dinner on Just Eat? Um, I set myself a little project over the Christmas period to have a play around and try and replicate it using Canvas apps. It's more than possible. Um, have a play around with that. It's quite well publicised guides on how it works as well. Um, strongly encourage people to take on these kind of pet projects and. Do things just for the sake of learning. Sometimes it's hard with customer deadlines to learn new things, but once you've learned them, they're there from day one and you, you build like that, basically. Yeah, I, I really do appreciate it. And def, definitely sort of, sort of look into as well. As well, It's just like, because a lot of times there's a lot of people on, on this call have probably experienced, experienced in the past. It's like, it's quite easy for like, like customers or people you work with to like, bring people like late to the party when it comes to like design actual system as well and i've had a few a few projects projects recently where like we fully developed it fully designed it it's been working fine but then somebody else who's like who wasn't involved in the initial scope and just all of, all of a sudden just sudden joins and just starts like adding like loads like design features features they want so as it's just like um as as well as well i've, I've been like like looking at ways to ways to manage that sort of aspects of, of projects as well um, one thing I do like to do that I've found really, really useful, um, particularly with government projects and heavily user-centered design ones, is anything you build, build it in such a way that it's easy to change. Yeah. So, for example, app formulas for your colors, um, environment variables for email content, um, use templates as much as possible. You can guarantee, as you said, someone will come late to the party and say, I don't like that paragraph of text. If that's hard coded and difficult to change, yeah, that's a pest. If it's yeah. an environment variable or a template or something like that, go in, change it once, it changes it everywhere in the app, everyone's happy. Um, I've yet to find a project that you didn't have a, a last minute person stepping in and saying, here's a million changes. We know what's going to happen. Let's prepare for it. Yeah, I appreciate appreciate that. Yeah, um, Josh. Yeah, hi, Stuart. It's uh, an awesome talk. Um, yeah. there were some really cool points there as well. Um, I just wanted to add that we're, we're kind of using app formulas quite a bit with the modern controls and custom pages to try and kind of create you know, those kind of custom pages to look really similar to a model-driven app experience to make it look like it's actually part of a a model driven app and you know just be able to get off the ground and create something that looks the same um, and uh, great for that so you know just the, the speed of development that they enable uh, pretty awesome yeah i am disappointed that despite the new look and feel soon being generally available 
there's very, very limited customization options. Um, as simple as being able to change the, the equivalent of base, base palette control on Canvas apps. I feel like it's going to have to come soon for model driven apps. And when it does, being able to being able to pick your color for your header and then push it into your custom pages is probably going to be quite important as well. Like as soon as they change that and notice everything is the standard blue, we're all going to come unstuck and have to go in and make changes to all these custom pages. So strongly encourage use the base palette property like I showed earlier on in preparation for that inevitable moment. I feel like it is getting like advanced finder where they keep saying soon, 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 soon. And I don't know if anyone's checked recently, you can still access legacy advanced find. If anyone doesn't know how system settings advanced and it's right there in the top right where it's always been. Despite that now being deprecated since three years ago. Scary times. Um, Lee. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Really good demo. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, where do you think CSS uh, sort of fits into this? If it has a place at, at all uh, in terms of like Canvas apps? Um, I do use CSS quite a bit. CSS and HTML can refer back to your app formulas as well, which is great. So I like to use string interpolation to pull back basically things like the font size, all that kind of stuff. If you are using fancy HTML controls for building all sorts of stuff or using CSS, it's not the only tool in the box. There's no need to hard code fonts, colors, all that sort of thing. Use the tools you've got available. Um, really great example on a project that I was working with, with Madeline and Waradana, who's also on the call tail end of last year. We produced a thing that looks like a government website, heavily using the native CSS that's on there. Plugged in some, at that point it was variables, mind you, but plugged in some values, combined them together. And when they said, oh, I don't like that blue. OK, we'll change that blue. It's not hard coded. It's in there, it's in a variable at that point. It would now be a formula. Change it once done. One thing I always consider with these as well, out there somewhere, there's always another customer with this problem. That customer will inevitably have a slightly different color palette. Been able to have something that you've built in the past that you can, we call it white label, basically borrow and take off the customer branding. Been able to use something like app formulas within your custom CSS to make it look like what they're used to has really, really revolutionized their pre-sales. So it's it's always worth considering sometimes CSS and HTML are the right tool for the job, but how can we combine it with the other tools we have? Does that help? Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from anyone? Um, do see a few bits in the in the chat. Um, Nathan's just said he's got a drop. Um, I think he's gone, so too late for me to say goodbye. But special thanks to Nathan for joining from so far away. Um, Charlie has put in the Fluent Theme Designer. Um, as you quite rightly pointed out, yeah, that is really, really good. Worth mentioning that is targeted at the app on start, but it's very, very easy to modify a, a JSON object from the app on start using set something value app formulas it's just the name of the i don't want to say variable because it's not a variable the name of the output equals and then that same json object would work so although that was originally targeted at on start it's very very easy to modify and the the value is still there um clayton oliviera um, i'm going to be sharing the theme code in the blog post that's coming in the next couple of days it's too big to put in the chat, I'm afraid. But yeah, we'll certainly share that out. And Jamie, I understand you've now got a link to the GDS kit from, from someone else earlier on as well. Yeah, that's there from, from Will Johnson. So thanks for popping that in, Will. Can I, I just tag on to that, Stuart? Um, the, the GDS 
um, if if you don't need to try it, I'd give it a go anyway from a mm. from a recruiter point of view. I try not to be a recruiter on these calls, but it's quite a uh, good. Um, even if you're not using it commercially, it's quite a good um, understanding to have. Uh, if you if you have a look at a project, whether it's contract or, or whatever, give it give it a, give it a go. It's a bit of advice. Um, I'm putting it on your CV on LinkedIn as well if, um, if you've used that. I was interviewing towards the tail end of last year, and the company I now work for at that point weren't massively interested in working with government. They now are. There's a lot of work there. Yeah, like <laughs> for power platform people. There's a lot going on, and even things like the police, for example, the police are now leading towards power platform. Um. The various different transport sector companies are all leading towards power platform. Being perfectly honest, half the planet's leading towards it. There's a bunch of funding out there that Microsoft are providing to customers. And just like I said earlier on as well, the GDS design kit is generally pretty good. Like the underlying principles behind it are brilliant. I would strongly encourage if anyone's got a spare 10, 15 minutes at some point in their diary, pop on there. Pop into Canvas apps, build a couple of components, see the kind of things that are involved in it, and take that forward to your next project. And, and consider those things, even if you don't use their covers and their design, the principles behind it are probably more important than what it looks like. Now, thank you everyone for joining. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And any questions whatsoever, do reach out to me on LinkedIn or contact Sarah for, for contact details. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for coming back, Stuart. You look great in your shortlist T-shirt there. Thank uh, you very much. <laughs> <Here's yours. laughs> um, but yeah, no, that was awesome. Great to have you back. It's been a while, so mm -hmm. really enjoyed that. And um, obviously positive comments from everybody. Um, Let's not wait so long till next time. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'll be back I next week. totally blame you, but um, hopefully things will quieten yeah. down a bit for you. Maybe no, not. It's never going to quiet. It's just a different <laughs> video. Have a great <laughs> evening, everyone. Speak soon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B